How much rain did you get? I've gotten a half inch so far and I'm praying for more. Might get some more coming this weekend. I got 1.3 inches and uh, it was good, slow, soaking in rain. I didn't have any standing water this morning, but boy, my collards and cabbage sure loving it. I'm going to be eating collards soon. And I ain't been two weeks transplanting them. Now, that's pretty fast. You can transplant collards and be eating them in a month. That's pretty good. We did the same thing with some turnips, but I'm going to tell you what, I'm feeling a lot better. Weather's cooled off, got a little moisture in the ground. I'm getting to start to shake a little bit. I'm getting all hyped up. I checked my phone earlier, and then for the next two weeks forecast, the, the hottest we're going to get is uh, 82 which is good, and we got deer season coming around the corner, mm -hmm. so that's, that's going to be good for that, it too. Is. Let's say hey to everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. We've got a really good show planned for you tonight. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about fall pest control. We have some unique pests we have to deal with in fall. It's a little different than our spring and summer pest control, so we're going to talk about some strategies there. But before we do that, we always have a little show and tell time on the show. And uh, so we, we got some moisture, we are getting some cooler weather. Uh, I've got a lot going on and still a lot to do. I've got um, all my cabbages, cauliflower, broccoli, collards, all that's doing real good. They've started to really take off and grow. Yep. Um, this last weekend, we'll have that coming up in a video, I think next week. I've got uh, beets transplanted, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, and some calendula cool flowers put in the ground now a day after i put those in the ground i guess i didn't give enough water when i transplanted them i come home that afternoon and everything was laid over on the ground and it broke my heart because i'd spent a few hours out there doing it but i threw the put the sprinkler on them and um let it run and then that revived them a little bit and this rain come and now I went out there this morning and everything's looking fine again. So I didn't lose them completely, but I was worried for a minute. You was close. I was close. Well, what has happened is now I knew this was going to happen. So we've been hot and dry. Now I'm going to be honest with everybody. We've been disappointed. Haven't got out in the garden, done a lot. I mean, you have, we had 90 degree days. We ain't had no rain in weeks. Dirt was like powder and you just didn't feel like getting out there doing a whole lot. And I knew this was going to happen. Weather cooled off. We got some of this fall touches you in the morning when you walk outside and it shakes you a little bit. We got some moisture and now we all juiced up. Mm -hmm. And you need to be planting. You need to prepare it a little bit before this, but if you didn't, I'm going to tell you something. Now is the time to get out and get something done. And I want to go over with a few things that you got to get in the ground now. Especially if you live in the southeastern or southwestern United States. If you live below uh, Pennsylvania down this way, you need to be getting your turps and your mustard in the ground. And I want to touch on that just for a second. Go for it. Go for All right. <clears throat> now, on your turnips, we have got, I'm going to talk about, we got, actually got three different varieties, but I'm also going to talk about two today. Look uh, what I done did. Dropping stuff already. I had to grunt when I get down now. Mm. Come back up. Uh, All right. So we have got two, and I ate me a mess of these the other night. We got this one called Top, All Top Turnip. All Top, so that is All Top. Now root, if you don't care nothing about the root, which I don't really, uh, that's the one to go with. Yeah, now this All Top here has got kind of a mustard flavor to it. Uh -huh. But I'm gonna tell you, I ate me a pot full of them the night, and it didn't take many of them to do it. And I got to admit I was wrong on something, but I'm gonna do that in just a minute if you don't mind. Well, I, I was gonna go ahead and mention that for a second, <clears throat> but uh, I so, am wrong every now and then. When I do, I like to admit that I'm wrong. So when we first got this variety in, I went out to the greenhouse and I planted me a flat of them. And uh, I didn't necessarily have room in my garden for them. Uh, or I didn't make room in there, but I planted some of these at my consultant farm and I had some plants left over. And I tried to get this fellow to plant some of them in his garden, and he uh, specifically told me uh, that you don't transplant turnips. And um, but Miss Hoss was a little smarter than him, and she planted some down there in her raised beds, and they eat some last night. So you had to eat a little bit of crow on your. I had to eat a little transplant. bit of crow, and they were good. Now I'm gonna dig down a little deeper on this right here because I don't okay. feel like you've touched enough on this right here. Okay. 
Now, the all top turnip is the way to go if you don't care a lot for the root and you love the leaf like we do. However, this is the way you want to grow these. You want to transplant them or you want to grow them in a raised bed. You don't want to be growing a huge, big, you don't want to be direct seeding these on a huge, big acreage unless you really want to do that because they get a little pricey. Yeah, the, the quarter pounds of these are a little more pricey than the quarter pounds of your basic uh, purple top turnips. This is a hybrid variety, very specialized variety, a great variety, but it ain't a variety you're going to go out there, till you up a plot and just throw some seeds out there. Yeah. Uh, these are, you know, you want to make sure you get your money's worth out of every seed. Yeah. Now, to give you an example of what's going on here, we got these packs, which are, what, three ninety nine dollars on the pack? All the packs are three ninety nine. And there's a thousand seed in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we have these quarter pound packs here. Yeah. And these quarter pounds are $49.99 on this hybrid turnip seed. Now you say that's a lot of money, and it is. We understand $49.99 don't come easy. But folks, there's 30,000 seeds in this quarter pound. 30,000 seeds in a quarter pound. So you can get a lot out of that right there. But you want to make sure you know what you're doing, you got it set up right if you're gonna plant these all top turnips. Uh, I would, this is Compare my- Compare that to the purple Well, top, I am, but, but now this right here, I think you probably need to start out in a raised bed or a smaller area. Make sure you're gonna like them and then kick it up. But I'm gonna tell you, as it stands right now, I'm a big fan of them. Now, let's move on to the purple top. The purple top. Now, a lot of folks, including me, has always planted these purple tops and, and, and we get it and we got it. So we got the purple tops in, 1,000 seed, $3.99 for your pack, but, I think this is the way to go. Quarter of a pound of these for $9.99. And there is 50,000 seeds in this pack right here. You can throw them. You can throw these right here. Don't be buying, your, unless you got a little bitty raised bed, don't be buying this. Go ahead and spend $9.99 and get these right here. There's quarter pound with 50,000 seeds in there. Now we got these listed on the website under turnips. We got a, a column and a tab underneath it that says turnips. Now let's move on just a minute to mustard. We beans. also had the white globe. We got the white globe. Oh, I didn't touch on that. Turn. We'll touch on that on a different show. Now let's move on to the mustard greens a little bit because if you live in the south, you got to be growing you some mustard greens. The old standby that everybody has grown for years is this Florida broadleaf. Thousand seeds in our seed pack, three ninety nine. Same thing. If you're planting your little four before raised bed, get the pack. That'll be fine. And another thing too, you'll be surprised how much you can grow in a little four before raised bed when you start direct seeding these, these mustard greens. And that's the same one that we use as a cover crop to control nematodes. So it's dual purpose. It is. And now if you go to shopping on our site for these mustards, you need, you're gonna have to go to the greens tab and look underneath the greens. And we have our mustard listed underneath the greens tab. However, we do sell it in a quarter of a pound pack right here. Now, and this is my humbled opinion, don't be buying those little beauty packs when you can buy this right here for $7.99. And a lot of companies don't offer these in these side packs, but we had a lot of people wanting it and we pre-packed them and we got a quarter pound right here for $7.99 and then 70,000 seeds in a quarter of a pound. Now that's a heck of a buy. You can get a thousand seeds for $3.99 or? 50,000. No, excuse me, 70,000. For 70, twice as much. Yeah. yeah. So get your 70,000 these. If you don't use them all, put them in the refrigerator and save them for later. Now, let's move on to one more thing, and I'll, and I'll bow down just a little bit. We got these Southern Giant Curled Mustard, which is an All-American Selection winner right here. Same thing, we got them in 1,000 C, 3.99, or for $9.99, you can get you a quarter pound. Same thing, quarter pound, a good bit of seed, 55,000 seeds in a quarter pound. So you got plenty of seeds there to get out there, direct seed them, seed them kind of thick, and you can have you a good mess of mustard. I'm gonna tell you for $9.99, that's a lot of eating right there. You can take your little bed, Get it look nice and prepared, throw them on it, rake them in, you'll have you a nice little And if you don't mustard. use them all, give the rest of them to a friend or neighbor, encourage them to grow you a, them a little mustard patch there also. For $9.99, you make your neighbor happy. And when you till them in, you're going to help out your nematode yep. problem. So well. I just want to throw that out there. If you're wondering what you need to be doing right now, you need to be planting them turnips and you need to be planting those mustards now. 
And I'm subject to start me, uh, whether you like it or not, start me another tray of them all tops and find me a spot to put some. Yeah. Um, I don't I'm, You won't be making fun of me. I won't be making fun of me anymore. No, I won't. One more, a uh, couple more things I want to talk about. So we've had, uh, we're not at the expo this year, which is going on this week. Um, we actually, as we are growing, uh, we had to take this fall, this opportunity to make some improvements in our warehouse. We want to be able to, no matter how big we get, to still get orders out the same day we receive them. That's one of the most important things to us is to not make our customers wait when they order something. So when you order something yeah. by three o'clock Eastern, we want to be able to get it out that same day. So we've had to, to take some time and some energy and some effort to improve some things in our warehouse. So as we get more and more orders every year as we grow, we can still get those orders out um, the day we receive them for the most part. Yeah, we had a couple of days last year that we had trouble getting all the orders out. And I tell everybody in the office here, I said, look here, I've never ordered anything on the internet and I wanted to wait two weeks to ship it to me. Every time I've ever ordered anything, I want it then. So we pride ourselves on getting them orders out the same day. We had to spend a little money. We got to do some things in the back. We've been working on for a month or two. This week's been kind of hectic with it also. Computer upgrades, new shipping software redoing everything and we're getting all that prepared for busy spring because we know when you order something you want to ship that day and that's what our intentions are and we're going to try to keep everything in line so we can do that and to serve our customers better than anybody else that's right so we're not at the expo this week but we have had a lot of good visitors a lot of people stopping by that are on the way to the expo or uh, on their way back so it's been really nice to to talk to our customers and uh, give them a little mini yep. tour around here and all that. The last thing I want to talk about is I want to do a little <clears throat> giveaway. So we, a lot of times people send us tools they want us to try out and maybe carry on our website and stuff. And there's one tool, it's kind of similar to this one that we carry called a Hodag. And it's a really good seller for us. And it's made in Idaho, mm -hmm. if I'm uh, correct there. And the guy started making some other tools and some of the stuff we get, we like it, but it's just not something we're really ready to carry at that point for one ever reason or the next, the price point or, or whatever it is. But we do have, we are overrun with tools. Well, we've got plenty of tools and, and we have some extra and we want to share the wealth on these. So this is a tool kind of like the Hodak, except it's got the little fork there. This is a nice little rake and this is a nice little shovel. And these are all made in the USA tools. High, high quality, really good weld on these. Sharp. Yep. Um, it's made by a company called Coleman Metalworks and they're under the Hodag brand. It's great people and they have great tools and we're gonna give them away today. Yeah, so these are all short handle tools. It'll be perfect for somebody that did raised bed or container garden. So. Are oh, we gonna give all three to I'm one gonna person? give all three to one person as a set. So all you gotta do is in the comments below, tell me why you need these tools. Tell me why these tools are gonna to help you be able to grow food better this fall or next year. So give me a little story. Tell me why you need these tools here and we'll pick one of the commenters and uh, we'll bundle these up and send them to you. So look forward to hearing everybody comments there you know what i mentioned earlier it's about us being hot and dry the fall of the year we always know we got more insect pressure than we do any other time of the year and we have been faced with a tremendous white fly problem here in the last three to four weeks mm -hmm. uh, white flies love hot dry weather and for some reason or other we've decided to have a hot dry summer and our pressure has been a little higher than we've had in the last three or four years and i have battled white flies now with the weather changing just a little bit, I hope that we see less pressure and there. Get better, hopefully. But we've been we've been and we want to talk about that today. Some of these some of these problems that you can anticipate having with your fall garden. Not being said we can't get by, we can't control it, we can't work through it, but you need to be aware of it and you need to be what you're facing and how to attack it and uh, get it done and go on. Yes, yeah, so we've done shows in the past on our pest control strategies for for warm weather crops, but I don't think we've ever done one for cool weather crops. And I was doing some research online and there's really not a whole lot out there on actually specific control of fall pests. Cause our program is much different than it is in the spring. It so is. We're not dealing with squash bugs now. Uh, we're not dealing with a, 
a lot of your um, like leaf footed bugs that get on tomatoes. There's a lot of pests that we're not dealing with right now. And it, there's, but there's a few specific fall pests that most people struggle with, mm -hmm. and we've got some pretty good solutions. Yeah. Worms can be a, a, a worse issue in the fall, especially on leafy brassicas and things like that than we'd have in the springtime yeah. normally. And we don't have as much disease risk when it cools down, but there are some diseases sure. we need to be aware sure. of. And, and uh, powdery true. mildew is, is one that I've had a little bit of issue with in the last couple of weeks. I first noticed it in the greenhouse, and the reason it was in the greenhouse is because we was trying to get some seeds up and I was watering it three or four times a day. So we had very high moisture content in that greenhouse and it was very still days. We didn't have a lot of wind brewing and I got an outbreak of some powdery mildew in the greenhouse first. Then I noticed it a couple of days ago in my wife's raised beds down there. So we've had a little bit of outbreak on that. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of just a few <clears throat> fall pests that we deal with. And, th and this could be different from region to region. And let us know in the comments there uh, if, if we there's some we don't mention, some fall pests that you struggle with. And we'll be glad to provide some suggestions yep. for those in upcoming shows. So you mentioned white flies. White flies, you know if you got them. Because at my house, they were a couple of days ago, you could just, you wouldn't even be close to the garden, walk around. They're just swarming around your head um right there before dark they were all over my cucumbers if you've got collards planted now and you turn over that leaf you're probably going to see a few there yeah the white flies are easy to kill here's to the key to it you want to get real good coverage and that white fly is living on the underside of that leaf so you want to spray early in the morning at daylight or either late in the afternoon right before sunset and you want to get very good coverage underneath that leaf and once you get that and get on them you can kill them and that keeps your population down you know, we'll get 100% of them, but you're going to get them under control. Yeah, having a real good spray nozzle that kind of makes a fine mist gives you some... And really if you can get care. down there and spray underneath up, I know it's hard, but if you can get that nozzle underneath and spray back up, it helps. The other two, that, and two of the probably that we hear about the most people having issues with are the worms on the brassicas, your cabbage looper and your cabbage worm. Yep. Little grain worms, you'll know them if you see them. You go out there at night with a, a good headlamp, uh, you can usually find them. Not or they'll be eating on your leaves and you can find the damage. You know, both of them are, are, you treat them the same way. When you have the problem with worms, you treat them all the same way. So it's not very important to get bogged down and identifying each type of worm because the treatment's the same. Right, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Those two are pretty easy uh, to manage or control. The last couple here are more ones that are gonna eat on them turnips we talked about. And uh, I've had problems in the past especially with the uh, flea beetles and the aphids. They'll go in there, and, and they don't do it as much on brassicas that are a little thicker, but on those real tender leaf greens like turnips, mustard, sometimes your Chinese cabbage, they'll go in there and eat around those veins, and that leaf will look like a skeleton if you let them get after it. Yeah, and you have aphids underneath the bottom side of the leaf sometimes. Aphids seem to cycle in, cycle out, sometimes the worst. Now, I will say this right here. One of the crops that you can grow that I've noticed didn't have a lot of pest problems as far as insect pest problems is lettuce. Lettuce, right. For some reason or another, the worms are not as bad, the flea beetles, the aphids, none of that is as bad on, if you plant lettuce out there besides broccoli, they're gonna get that broccoli before they do that lettuce. Lettuce, for, from my standpoint, seem to be more insect tolerant than a lot of other things that we've planted in the fall of the year. I'll tell you another one, Swiss chard. Oh yeah, Swiss chard's tough. You don't have a whole lot of issues with yep. it as well. Okay, so those are the kind of pests we deal with in the fall. Let's talk about some of the products we use in our, our program for doing it. So let's start off with the worms. So we've got kind of two products for the worms. And uh, the first one that's going to be your first line of defense is your BT here. Um, so this is a naturally occurring bacteria. We sell it in the concentrated form here. You mix one ounce per gallon. And uh, this is going to take care of all your worms. And for the most part, this is what I'm going to use all fall. And I'm going to spray this about once a week. And I'm going to get some good coverage on all those brassicas. Now, that being said, this is a great product, but you need to be more on the preventive side you do the curative side. So understand that you're gonna have a worm problem, start this early, and it'll help control them before you get a serious problem. Because they have to ingest this before they die. Now, say you was to have just an absolute outbreak and you had worms out there doing some serious, serious damage, that's when you need to come in there with some spinosad. 
which is a little more powerful product than this is. They're both still organic. They're both Omri registered, but just spin a sad is going to be a little more powerful. A little more aggressive than the BT. The so, BT is a wonderful product, but it's used more earlier in a preventive stage than the Spinosad. So if you get an outbreak, go with the Spinosad and you can knock it back. And I've been spraying this on my corn yep. to keep the earworms down. Yep. So those are our two kind of worm controls. Uh-oh. Making a mess. Mm. So those are our two kind of worm controls, your BT and your Spinosad. Now let's talk about... Um, our insects. So we've got two here. And one of these, this one in particular, I don't use a lot during the warm season because yeah. you can't really use it uh, when it gets too hot. Yeah. But in the cool season garden, your horticultural oil is very, very handy and very, very useful. Yep. So we're going to use this for aphids. Uh, you can use it for white, white flies. Uh, what's the temperature? There's a maximum temperature you want it? <sighs> Yeah, we never did like to spray it above, above 80 degrees. I get a little nervous on horticultural oils. Yeah, so, uh, but as it's cooling down yeah. and things should be in the 70s from here on out, you're good to go with this stuff. And you can mix this with, with the other stuff. It mixes fine. Shake it up a little bit. It's a little more viscous than some of the other products are. Viscous. <laughs> viscous. But hort oil is a great general use for the fall garden. Yeah, another thing too, and I don't, I don't get bogged down on this, but if you got ornamentals around in your yard and you have a scale problem during the wintertime, this is your go-to product to spray during the wintertime for your scales. So it's a, it's a great product to use anywhere in your, your ornamentals in your yard. You got daylilies, anything like that. You just, the precautionary is you just don't want to spray it in very hot conditions. The second one we'll use for our non-worm uh, insects there is Nemo. And this is another one. You don't want to spray this in the summertime when it's super hot, but this time of year, it's going to well, work Well, you can great. get by with that more than you can in your horticulture. Or you, you can get by with that better early in the mornings, late in the afternoon. You definitely don't want yeah. to spray during the heat of the day. Right. This stuff can degrade in intense UV sunlight. So you want to spray it in the mornings or preferably in the evenings. Nemo is also a fungicide, so it's going to help you there. Mm -hmm. as well so this is going to help with your flea beetles your aphids yeah it's a great kind of product it's, yeah, i'd be honest with you it's my go-to product i probably use more neem more than i do anything then we always just to be comprehensive with things when we're spraying an insecticide i always like to add a fungicide to it now we don't deal with quite as many diseases this time of year as we do when it's really hot but i always like to add uh, a fungicide in there and my go-to here is this organic register, this Omni, Omri listed one, the, our complete disease control. Mm -hmm. And um, that's gonna help you out with, with just general diseases that you're gonna have uh, in the fall. Now this particular product here, the large commercial growers also use a lot of this. It's named Serenade, which is a little, it's a different label on there, but this is a widely used, well-received product that's being out I can remember when they first came out with it, it's been about maybe 10 to 15 years ago. A company out of California developed this. It's a great product. It has a motivation that's really unique, which, which makes it good. So it has a wide array of uh, properties that fight different diseases. Great product. And it, what it is, it's easily mixed with any, we can mix this with any of our insecticides. Right. Now, if you start having some serious disease problems, some, um, mildews which we can still get this time of year beets can get a disease called circospora um, broccoli some people get what they call black rot on their broccoli mm -hmm. and their other brassicas then you want to step it up to the liquid cop there yeah and uh, this is going to be a little more powerful than the complete disease control this is not omri listed but it, it's it's not toxic at all uh, a little side note there, if you got fire blight on your pear trees, that's the product you want to use right there. So we'll use the liquid cop as well as the fungicide, and you can mix this with the other products as well. So let me go over kind of my program or rye rotation, and this would be different from, for, uh, could vary from person to person just based on what your pressure is, but I'll tell you what I'm going to be doing. So let me get my line up here. You can hold these for me. So this one, this one, and then this one. So I usually like to spray once a week, have you a spray day. My spray day is Sunday evenings. That's just when it works out best for me to do it. So one week 
I'm going to do this. I'm going to do the BT. I'm going to do the Hort oil and I'm going to do the complete disease control. I'm going to mix those three together. And then the following week, let's take that one out. I'm going to do BT, neem oil, and then I'm going to do the liquid cop. Okay, so that's my rotation. BT every week, and then I'm going to rotate the neem oil and hort oil, and I'm going to rotate the liquid cop and the complete disease control. That is what I'll be doing. That's a good program. Now, one other thing I mentioned earlier, powdery mildew. We got this product here called Bicarb. It's a little small bottle there. This is the, for strictly powdery mildew, this is the best curative product out there that I know of. This is a great, this is a great one here. If you have, you need to keep you a little bit of this on hand. I don't know that I would work it into my program like you've got there. And right. I think that's a good program you got. I, would, I keep this in mind. If you have a targeted if, problem. If you have a targeted outbreak of powdery, and I'll tell you where you're going to have this. If we start having some of those overcast days, we'll have that light drizzle. And we have it for a couple of three days. That's ideal condition to set up for powdery mildew. When you have that and you start noticing it, get this out, pop it on it, spread it. And this is a curative for uh, powdery mildew. It actually, when it kills it on contact, which is very unusual. But and that's very important as well. I had a lady yeah. comment on the video, I think it was this morning, saying she had powdery bad on her English peas. And I told her that's the... Boom. Boom. Knock it out real yep. quick with that right there. Yep. So... Boom. I hope we were able to cover kind of most of any kind of fall pest and disease issues. If you have any others that we didn't address, please put those in the comments and we'll be glad to help and maybe answer them on next week's show. So we got a few questions. I actually had a lot of questions from last week's show talking about onions. And if we answer your question on the show, send us your address or uh, send us an email to cussserve.com. Excuse me. I'm getting all messed up. Mm. Send us an email to cuss serve at hosstools.com with your address and we'll send you a nice little prize okay first question is from case ground and uh, they want to know what's a vidalia onion when i garden i only grew onions one time and they just did okay just don't know much about onions mm. a vidalia onion has to be grown in a specific area around lines lines georgia vidalia georgia that area, tombs county they have a specific area up there that the Vidalia onion has to be grown in that area to be labeled a Vidalia onion. Now we've mentioned, when we talk about our onion seed here, we've mentioned a couple of times about Vidalia onion seeds. They is varieties that have to be approved for Vidalia onion production. And we carry some of those that we've mentioned before. Sweet Harvest. Sweet Harvest, Savannah Sweet. Savannah Sweet are two of the ones that we carry that are Vidalia variety approved. Now, we can grow, in my opinion, just as sweet as onion down here is what they can in Vidalia. We just can't call them Vidalia onions. We can call them Vidalia type onions, which means that they is the same type that they grew up there. So, you know, growing onions in the garden is a great thing. I think it's something that everybody should be doing. You can grow sweet onions also. Now, the two things I see people do wrong with onions is they plant the wrong variety at the wrong time, and they don't give them enough fertilizer. So make sure you plant the right variety at the right time of the year and get you do your little research. Make sure you got the right fertility program out there because they take a lot of nitrogen. They take some sulfur. If you'll do those two things there, onions are easy to grow, and I think you'll be successful and proud that you did it. One more thing about the Vidalia. So that type of onion, the, the traditional Vidalia type, is a yellow it's kind of flattened onion and you'll see it called a yellow granix. So if you see the term yellow granix, granix just means flattened. If you see that terminology, yellow granix or granix, it's the same thing as a Vidalia onion. It's just not grown in Vidalia. There are several different varieties that they grow as Vidalia onions. Yeah, Bruce told me that they're, what they grow up there, there's probably about 20 different varieties they yeah. consider Vidalia. Some are real flattened. The trend seems to be going to more of a, a rounder bulb from what I hear. Yep. David Montgomery asked, great video as always. Any updates on your sweet potatoes? Yeah, and I actually need to do a video on this pretty soon. So my plot is still looking good. I, I'm really happy with what I did this year and, and just dedicating the whole plot to them. Let them just cover the whole thing. I've been hands off with it. I did water them a little bit here and there, um, 
before we had that rain come in. I went in there and scratched a few up. Um, the problem with that is it was so daggum hard. The dirt was so hard that uh, I couldn't even get a pitchfork in there. So yeah, they need to be dug. I need to mow them and then I need to dig them, but I was waiting on some rain to make that dirt softer. And I was waiting on some cooler weather because I'll be dog if I want to dig sweet potatoes in 85, 90 degree weather. A lot of our people have already dug their sweet potatoes in different climates. A little tip there that we may have mentioned before, but we'll mention again here that the steel boy has taught us about. Mow those vines down about a week before you dig those potatoes and it'll make that potato hard, the skin harden up and make it last better. So yeah, they'll hold up better, hold up better. During, when you pick them and throw them around. A little tip for you there. All right, third question is from John Maylock, and he says, when you plant onions in November, he's in East Texas, I assume you mean transplants. When do you start these uh, seeds in the trays? You're correct, I do mean transplants. Pretty much on onions and any type of plant that you plant with transplants, you can back that baby up six weeks and start your seed in the greenhouse. So if we're planting onions the 1st of November and you're gonna grow your own from seeds, your own transplants, you wanna back it up six weeks and that puts you where? Middle of October? Early October. Early but, October. But, but we'll, you, we'll plant. We planted onions anytime in November, you should be fine. Uh, so, if, you know, if you're going to plant onions in November, you need to get your seeds started right now. Yeah, you should have already had them planted, but you can get them planted now. It's probably still but four to six weeks. I try to lean more on the six week time mm -hmm. is the time it takes to grow a seed to a decent transplant. So from transplant time, you can normally back it up four to six weeks, more on the five to six week end of it there. There you have it. All right. All right. And condes. Constance. Constance. Constance Lovejoy says, how about red onions? Are they long, intermediate, or short day? We love to grow red onions. Yeah, so actually there are yeah. red onion varieties for short day, for intermediate day, and long day. So you've got red varieties for each of those. Uh, the, one, the reds we've grown before is a red creole, and we should be adding that to the site at some point. Uh, we'll carry that variety, and there's another one called Southern Bell Red. I like the red creole. One thing about red onions, red onions, I've talked to Bruce and them about this, they, cause they always bolt quicker than the other ones do. And that's just the thing with red onions. They're gonna bolt a little earlier. A lot of times they don't get quite as big. I don't grow as many reds as I do with the others. They, they don't store as well, but it is nice to have some red onions. So I always grow a little row or two of red ones. And you can find red onion varieties for short, intermediate, and long day. Yeah, we have an intermediate variety called candy that's very popular. That's not a red one. That's not a red one? No, no, it's white. Now, there is a red candy out there. I uh, thought I grew a red candy one time. You did. Ago. There is a red candy, but the candy we have oh, is, is, white. Okay. is a yellow onion. Okay. Uh, well, I stand corrected again. Again. You're having a rough day, ain't you? Mm. All right, so that's going to do it for tonight. Don't forget to put your comments in there if you have any questions and uh, tell us why you'd like to win this nice little set of hand garden tools here. And we'll be glad to read those. And um, we're gonna get back in the back and uh, finish up what we was doing and uh, get to work so we can get your orders out as yep. quickly as possible. Yeah, I know y'all juiced up, so make sure you got those your, your seeds in, your turnips and mustard. And folks, you got to get off that couch and get out and get it done. It's time. It's time. Hope you enjoyed the show. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that thumbs up. Hit that like button. And we'll see you guys next week. Later. Mm -hmm.